Need for a bridge to span the St. Lucie River in Stewart, Florida began around the turn of the century, when the only way to cross the St. Lucie River was by ferry, powered by an old Model T engine. In 1916, construction was begun on the Stewart St. Lucie River Dixie Highway Bridge, and at 3 p.m. on January 30, 1918, it was declared open to the public. So impressive for its day, the bridge was declared as an engineering marvel. For the first time, motors could travel uninterrupted from Maine to Miami. It was considered the best $80,000 ever spent. Work was begun on the present northbound bridge in January 1933 and opened to traffic on January 8, 1934. Crews worked around the clock to build the bridge. Sand and gravel were brought in by barge from New York via the port at Fort Pierce. By April 1933, 100 men were on site, creating a $3,000 weekly payroll. Skilled laborers earned 30 cents an hour, unskilled 20 cents. By way of contrast, today an unskilled laborer on the new Roosevelt Bridge earned 660 an hour. These were the days of the Great Depression in our country. The bridge was one of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal plans to get millions of Americans back to work. Out of gratitude to the president, the bridge was named in his honor. What a time of rejoicing when the bridge was opened. In fact, two days of celebration. The governor was on hand. President Roosevelt sent a telegram of congratulations. There were parades. The Goodyear blimp flew overhead. Just a time of great celebration. After the 10-ton country road roller was driven across the bridge without a crack or quiver, everyone walked or drove over the new $400,000 bridge. This bridge has served us long and faithfully. It was joined by its twin, the Southbound Bridge, in October 1964. This now brings us to the need for a new bridge. With over 50,000 motorists traveling across the existing two bridges each day, increasing population, escalating maintenance costs and breakdowns, a new bridge has become necessary. Now I'm trying to find out when this is going to be finished so that I can get to work on time. How's that bridge being supported up there? What are they going to do with the old bridge? When the new bridge is done, how am I going to be able to get into downtown? How safe is the new bridge? What is that big yellow machine over there? How long is the new bridge? When are you going to be able to drive over it? Just wondering when the bridge is finally going to be open. Hello everyone, I'm Tom Leary. And I'm Chip Gibson. These questions and many more will be answered during tonight's program. You'll learn many interesting facts about both the old and the new Roosevelt Bridges. You'll also be meeting some of the people responsible for building the new Roosevelt Bridge. The first person we'll be meeting this evening is Betty Hardy, Public Information Officer and DOT Spokesperson for the new Roosevelt Bridge. Betty, that's an interesting model of the new Roosevelt Bridge. Could you please tell us about it? I'd be very happy to, Tom. I'm very proud of my model. This was built by Tom Andrus of the Florida Department of Transportation, who worked on the design for the bridge. He built it exactly to scale. My little man here represents six feet, so we begin to see something of the magnitude of the bridge. But I'd like to briefly tell you about some of the components of the bridge. If I turn my model over and we look underneath here, we see these pegs, and these are called piling. There, this particular group is in a group of 16. We actually have some, uh, most of them in groups of 20, a few at 25. Now what these are, uh, the 16 would be closer to land. The 20 uh, groups of 20 would be out in the shipping lane for greater strength than uh, should a ship or barge actually hit the bridge, it would not do any damage. We turn this over and we this square thing that we see here, this is called a footer. Now the way that we get this, we would put a coffer dam around this. I, uh, explain that simply like a metal fencing goes around that the water is pumped out the concrete trucks come out and they pump the concrete and this forms the footer now this is out of a special mix it's called a microsilica mix this has to be pumped in at a special temperature they start like after lunch go late in the evening sometimes finish in 12 1 o'clock at night once it's completed they put potable water on it to keep it because it's a slow cure this is a special curing compound for the microsilica mix. This is a very special mix in the uh, concrete. That comes up 12 feet here of what we call our splash line. So we come on up and we begin to uh, look at our column. We have our first lift and our second lift. But one thing, Tom, look at the, uh, these lines in here. This is called the rustification. Now this doesn't give us any strength or anything special other than simply it is for beautification. Note the flare to the column. 
Then we come to our cast in place segment. Now what that simply means, Tom, is that they put forms around here and then the trucks come out and they pour this into place. Now this is called a segment, as I said, but this is also a segment. Now this is the one that you're more familiar with because this is the one that's cast in, up at White City, brought down on the big red trucks, and then is stored there on the site until it's needed. Once it is ready, they're ready to install it. It is picked up by the gantry hauler. It's taken over to the uh, gantry, which is now sitting on top of this pier table. The gantry picks it up and it takes it into, uh, in this position as it begins to take it to be installed on the bridge. It comes out in this position and is, um, comes across and then as it's swung into place, it fits exactly onto the segment that's uh, right next to it. So now we have this in place, Tom, and we know that it's going to fit because this uh, is process is called match casting. Everything that comes out to the bridge is going to match exactly, and this is all taken care of with the camera geometry up at the Rinka plant in um, Fort Pierce. As it comes out to the bridge, it's numbered, and so it has a particular place. Everything fits exactly. So this is placed here next to our pier table. Now, we're out of balance one segment, Tom. Remember, this is a balanced cantilever bridge. So we're going to do the same thing all over again, and we're going to place this one on the other side. We're going to hold it temporarily with our post tension and bar. Now we can go in and make this a permanent installation. Remember, there are holes all in the top of our segments here. This is a high steel seven strand cable. We put these in groups through here. It runs all through here and then is locked into place with this wedge. It is pulled with a jack that puts 350 tons of pressure on it. This is kind of like the old Chinese finger puzzle that we played to, uh, with as children. The more pressure, the tighter it locks it into place. So we have this locked into place now. Now we can take out our temporary bar and we can begin to do the same thing all over again. We're going to place one on the other side. We're going to hold it temporarily. We're going to place one on the other side. We're going to hold it temporarily. And then we're going to go in and post tension all of these in another hole here with our cable once again. Now, we have installed all the segments time from the pier table out to the center. We'll pretend that we have brought these from the other pier table out to the center, and we end up with a small opening here. The question becomes, then, okay, we know that a segment will not fit into this small opening. How are we going to, what are we going to do? So we form this, and we uh, pour what we call a closure pour. We now have all of this cantilever completed. We can now, in turn, move the gantry to the next pier table here and just begin the process all over again. One thing I would like to mention, we've talked about the cables or the tendons in the top. We also have what we call the transverse cable going this way. That is placed in there at the casting yard. And we also have them in the bottom. They're coming and they're connecting the two spans, our imaginary span over here in this span. So we have a lot of cable in our bridge. That was an interesting model. I hope that answered some of the questions you have on the new Roosevelt Bridge. Later on in the program, we'll be taking you inside the bridge for an up-close look at some of the components Betty spoke about. Stay tuned. Up next is George Denty, DOT Project Manager for the new Roosevelt Bridge. George, why did DOT decide that a new bridge was needed for our area? Well, we took into account, we did traffic studies that took counts to see if our capacities were adequate. We studied accident data. We looked at the bridge maintenance logs and uh, weighed those maintenance costs to determine if uh, a replacement was warranted and just how important and how quick it needed to be. What types of bridges were discussed and what was decided? Well, we certainly, during our PD&E phase, our project development and environment phase, we look at all options. We brainstorm to the point where we don't rule anything out and weigh those as far as practicality, cost effectiveness, effect on community, et cetera. And the net result is the new Roosevelt Bridge, which is a precast segmental 65 foot high fixed span. Was a tunnel ever seriously considered, George? Sure. In our process of evaluation, a tunnel was one of those viable alternatives. It fell out of favor during the analysis that the long-term maintenance cost would outweigh any advantages that it might have over a fixed span. Could you break down the cost of the new bridge? Sure. 
Our estimated construction costs are $48 million. Our engineering and inspection costs are estimated at $7 million. Our right-of-way costs were approximately $14 million. And our design costs were about $4 million. George, how will the new bridge affect our travel plans here in Stewart? Well, the travelers are going to have the opportunity to take the new bridge and bypass uh, the existing draw span and any problem they might occur as a result of openings, or they'll have the opportunity to use old US-1, which will become State Road 707, and access the Rio Jensen Beach area, as well as the downtown area. So they'll be uh, adequate access for the existing facilities, as well as an opportunity to bypass any of that if the travelers wish. George, how has the bridge construction affected local businesses? Well, it's been kind of a mixed bag. Some of those have suffered as a result of people's fear of barricades and the like and uh, not wanting to get caught in any sort of traffic jam. But for the same uh, reason, some people have visited the site out of curiosity. And we've actually had increases in business as a result of some of the workers using the local facilities. Does the new bridge have room for expansion? Yes, it certainly does. As a matter of fact, during the next phase of our traffic control, we'll be utilizing four lanes of traffic on the northbound bridge. But that's at the expense of using our eight-foot emergency lanes on either side of the bridge. Thank you, George. Sure. One of the interesting facts about the new bridge is that it'll be maintenance-free for the next 75 years. With over 50,000 cars traveling over the old bridge each day, and in 20 years an estimated 70,000 cars, we can begin to see the need for a new bridge. Up next is Betty Hardy, Public Information Officer for the New Bridge, answering some of the commonly asked questions. What is the height of the New Bridge and how does it compare to other bridges? Tom, it's actually 65 feet above high tide and what that means is if the water level is at the bottom of our footer, from that point to the bottom of our segment here would be 65 feet. Then our segment is 11 feet, so we would add our 65 to our 11, which means then we're in turn driving at 76 feet in the air. Now, our other bridges, our Palm City Bridge, for instance, is 55 feet in height, which again is above mean high tide. Just to give you some idea of the older bridges, our northbound bridge is 18 feet above mean high water, and our southbound bridge is 15 feet. Now, the minimum standard is 21 feet, so we begin to see how out of date these bridges indeed are. And what is the length of the new bridge, and how many total segments does it have? Our bridge is 4,565 feet in length, or three quarters of a mile, and we have 1,127 segments. And what are the plans for the old bridges? The northbound bridge is scheduled to be taken out below mud line, be taken out seven miles offshore and dumped, become an offshore reef. DOT plans to totally renovate the southbound bridge. It will get two lanes of traffic, one north and one southbound. The roadway will be completely redone, and we will be uh, redoing the bridge tender's house, making it uh, more in keeping with downtown Stewart. In fact, the city of Stewart right now is working on some plans for that building. So there are a lot of plans for that building. This will uh, in turn allow local traffic to use that or have an option either the new bridge or the old bridge. Are people going to be able to fish on or near the new Roosevelt Bridge? Tom, we will continue to have fishing from our southbound bridge. We have many ardent fishes, fishermen here. We would no way prohibit them from fishing there. We think it'll be much safer. But we have something that we're very, very excited about, and that is our new fishing pier. If you'll just look at the rendering that I have here to my back, we have a rendering artist rendering of our new bridge. Connecting with the park in downtown Stewart will be our new uh, fishing pier. This is approximately 550 feet in length, will be completely lighted, will have a railing around it, will be five feet above water, and will be a completely safe area for people, both adults and children, to fish. And now the most important question. Is the new bridge on schedule? Yes, we are, Tom. In fact, we're ahead of schedule. Right now, our official 
scheduled opening is for de mid-December. However, because we are ahead of schedule, we're looking to sometime in the fall. What we would like to do is be able to open the bridge before our winter visitors return. Of course, this all depends on the weather this summer. We could have, we hope we will not have bad weather, but we never know how many rain days or bad winds or whatever. So this is all dependent upon that. But right now, we think it, we are comfortable that we will be able to open sometime in the fall. Most viewers probably do not realize the amount of time involved to construct the segments required to build the new Roosevelt Bridge. In this next section of our documentary, we will show you the journey taken by one of the over 1,100 segments needed to construct the bridge. But before we tell you about the segments, let's look at some historical videotape of the first piling of this project being pounded into the ground in July 1994. The segments are poured in White City with the cooperation of Rinker Materials Corporation and Recce America Incorporated, a total of three segments are made each day. That's over 100 yards of concrete poured each day. The segments are carefully poured in a framework connected to the segment it will be next to over the river. A lot of work goes into this phase of the bridge construction and many of the segments for the southbound bridge are already made. The concrete segments are given more strength on top by having transverse tendons placed inside the concrete. This will help support the over 50,000 vehicles traveling across the bridge daily. Each segment is match cast against its mate in White City and then separated. A total of four segments a day travel to the project site in Stewart with a Florida Highway Patrol escort. The segments are sent to Stewart in the order in which they are needed. They are then picked up by the segment hauler and make their way to the gantry. Here's a look at some of the earlier segments that originated the beginning portion of the new bridge. The gantry then moves the segment to its final destination. Everyone is working together, preparing for the segment to come off the gantry. Epoxy is applied to its mating segment, and the new segment is turned into place. The temporary bars are locked down and will be removed once the permanent post-tensioning cables anchor the segment into position. Welcome back to Roosevelt Bridge, the old and the new. I'm Chip Gibson. Up next is Charlie Cross, the project manager for Recce America Incorporated, the prime contractor on the bridge. Tom and I went on top of the bridge and talked to Charlie about the operation of the gantry. Charlie, could you please explain to us how this big piece of yellow machinery called the gantry works? Well, this gantry you see behind us is uh, the machine that sets the segments in place on the bridge. And uh, a lot of the uh, legs you can see here move with the bridge as we complete a span and uh, it's unique in the way we have to erect the segments due to the fact that it's uh, we cannot do it from the water so uh, the gantry was designed specifically for this job and uh, it's adapted to it and uh, once we complete a span well then we it'll walk forward to the next span and uh, we just keep going until we get to the end of the bridge and turn around and uh, come back and start the uh, southbound side. What's the approximate cost of the gantry and can it be used again in further projects? Well, the approximate cost is uh, several million dollars uh, and it is it's, uh, an expensive piece of machinery. Uh, you have to have it in order to build a bridge like this. So uh, as far as using it again, uh, we always hoped that we could find a job that would be compatible for uh, it could be that uh, 
if it were not 100% compatible, we can uh, revamp it and uh, do a little bit of remodeling on it to make it work on the other one. Uh, sometimes it works, but other times you have to uh, forget it because it's not compatible. So we hope for the best on that. Charlie, it doesn't seem like there's that many workers out here to complete a project of this magnitude. Everyone pulling together as a team to complete this job? They, it is a teamwork. This type of a bridge is unique. It's a very high-tech bridge, and you have to have people trained in order to know when to fall in to a certain place, when to do a certain thing at the right time. And these people, at the beginning, uh, very few of them had ever been on a project like this. So uh, if you would see how they worked at the beginning compared to now, you would notice that they uh, would be like a football team. In the summertime and spring, they practice they look pretty sloppy. By the time season opens up uh, in the fall of the year, why they're all together as one unit, 11 people making one play work, and this is basically the same way. If you uh, have everybody pulling together, uh, it makes it a lot easier to achieve your schedule. Charlie, your firm, Recce America Incorporated, operates out of Italy and Miami. Is it pretty competitive to get a job in the state of Florida to build a bridge of this nature? Well, basically, uh, the company originates from Italy and uh, they set up headquarters in Miami and uh, when they came to America while well, they hired American engineers and uh, uh, technicians that were acquainted with this type of a bridge and they have built bridges in different states utilizing the same people from one job to another and uh, with all the background that these people have uh, it makes us very competitive the same as some of the other contractors that build the same type of bridge. So basically the company has American people, even though it is a foreign company. Charlie, this is a concrete segmental bridge. And please tell us a little bit more about how the gantry helps getting the segments in place. Well, basically, without the gantry, uh, the water at this area is so shallow that uh, there's a lot of areas you cannot get a barge and a crane that would be large enough to uh, handle each one of these segments we're looking at here weighs approximately 75 tons. And uh, when you run a barge across the river that's only uh, anywhere from a foot to three to four foot deep, why you'd have difficulties uh, setting segments in that area. So the gantry becomes very unique in a way that uh, it can work from the top and it won't interfere with the boat traffic on the bottom. And you can uh, advance it and if your bridge was eight miles long while well, the gantry would go eight miles so it makes it very unique. Have we encountered any problems so far with building this bridge Charlie? Uh, nothing major except for the weather we've had uh, several days we've lost due to inclement weather, rain and wind. When the wind reaches a certain speed while well, we're not allowed to operate this uh, for safety reasons. But other than that uh, no major problems that, uh, that we haven't solved that's going pretty smooth. How's the overall bridge project progressing as far as schedule? We're well pleased with it. Uh, we're ahead of schedule. Everything is uh, coming out good and we're well pleased with the way things are looking right now. Well, thank you, Charlie, for your time. We appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. The new Roosevelt Bridge is the first concrete segmental bridge. Chris, I understand your firm designed the new Roosevelt Bridge. That's correct, Tom. We were selected by the Florida Department of Transportation to design the concrete alternate for this bridge. Any project of this size, they generally go with two alternates. One of them is usually a steel and one of them a concrete alternate. And we were selected to, to design this type of bridge, which is a segmental box girder bridge. And why was this particular design chosen? Well, this type of bridge was chosen uh, largely because of the, the size of the bridge and the length of the spans we were going to have. The fact that uh, this bridge crosses over a river that's fairly shallow and doesn't allow a lot of barge traffic and being able to bring your equipment in on barges meant that we had to come up with something that could be erected uh, pretty much overhead, as you can see with the gantry on this type of structure. Chris, I understand that each segment is designed to go in a specific location, is that correct? That's correct. Each of these segments on the job is, is different. Each one is actually cast against its, its mating segment in the, the casting yard. And so each one has a specific location. Each segment is marked, and it has to go in that location when it's erected on the structure. And Chris, uh, how does this exactly support some of these segments on this new Roosevelt Bridge? 
Okay, this is what's known as a post-tensioning bar, and it's actually used as kind of a temporary bar. What this does is when they first lift a segment into place on the cantilever, they go ahead and, and put two of these in the top corner of the uh, segment and one of them in the bottom corner, and they stress this segment up against the next segment to it, and that's what holds it into place temporarily. And Chris, this particular uh, type of steel will help hold 70 plus tons of concrete in the air? Yes, it will, Tom. It's a, it's a very special steel. It's a very high strength steel made specifically for this purpose. Chris, I want you to explain a little more about how the bridge is being built. A lot of people drive by and they see the concrete segments hanging in the air and they don't understand how they're being held together. Explain the mystery. Okay, it's probably easiest if I show you a little bit about the segment and the different parts of it and how it's all held together. First thing, if you look at the uh, top slab of this segment, you've got what's known as the deck, and that's actually the portion of the bridge where the traffic rides on. Now, the width of the deck is set by the roadway width and how many lanes of traffic you need and that type of thing. What you can see in the top slab is you can see some holes. Uh, that's where the post-tensioning goes that will ultimately hold together the bridge. You can also look down what's known as the web. And on the web you see what we call shear keys. Now what the shear keys do is you actually have a set of male keys and female keys. So as each segment fits together, you have a perfect fit between the two segments. If you look inside the segment, you'll notice a couple of blocks, one at the top of the segment, one at the bottom of the segment. That's where the temporary post-tensioning bars that we talked about earlier go through the segment and actually hold this segment to the next segment. There'll be two of them positioned at the top and one of them positioned at the bottom. These are just held here temporarily until your permanent post-tensioning is put in at the top of the segment. Okay, I know one of the questions that often comes up is about the top slab and how thin it is. What's important on these segments is in lifting them in place and that is to keep the weight of them as low as possible. And so you use relatively thin members. Now, the top slab here actually has a transverse post-tensioning tendon that runs all the way through it. The same type of tendons that, that run this way and hold the bridge segments together also runs through the top slab and that actually compresses the top slab and gives it a uh, little extra strength than that. A lot of people feel that the bridge is being held together by glue. Could you please clarify that for us? Uh, yes, I could. The, between each segment, they use a special epoxy, and it's really better not to think of it as a glue. The epoxy really doesn't serve any purpose for strength. It has three primary purposes. First of all, as tightly as these segments fit together, the fact that they're all cast against each other and they fit specifically in a location, they act to lubricate the shear keys in that when you're pulling them together, and that keeps you from breaking any of the shear keys. A second reason they use epoxy is to, particularly in the top deck, is to prevent water from leaking into the bridge. It acts as a sealant. And then finally, the epoxy just serves to fill out any little imperfections between the segments. So when the bridge is completed, we'll have two separate bridges, correct? That's correct. Um, the structure here will end up carrying six lanes, three lanes in each direction with a five-foot sidewalk on each side. And that's really getting too wide to do with a single box. And what's happened is by building two separate boxes, you're able to go ahead and build one and put traffic over on it and then go ahead and construct the other one. Now, the, the two bridges are about five inches apart, and generally what you try to do is, since you're going to have a barrier to the inside anyway, a crash barrier in that, is you generally try to minimize your right-of-way, and so you want to put the bridges as close together as possible. Well, Chris, thank you for educating us on the segments. Well, you're welcome, Tom. Welcome back to our documentary, Roosevelt Bridge, The Old and the New. I'm Chip Gibson. And I'm Tom Leary. And Chip, next we'll take a look at some interesting footage from inside the new Roosevelt Bridge. We sure do have some great footage. Up next is Betty Hardy. He'll take us on a tour of the inside of the new Roosevelt Bridge. What we're actually looking at here is a segment that was set last evening 
on the back wall, we see some letters and numbers in orange. And what these mean are P, meaning Pier, 9 N, meaning 9 North, 16 D, meaning 16 Down. So we have Pier Table, 9 North, 16 Down, with U.S. with the arrow pointing to my, over my shoulder. This tells the operator exactly what segment and where it is to be placed in the bridge. Also, looking at this, we also see above my head, we see some bars. These are the temporary bars now that we also saw last evening. These are called duodag bars. These are, uh, were placed in temporarily last night to hold the segment into place. This, these will be taken out later once the segment is post-tension with the tendons. We also have the, have the bar in the bottom, so we're holding in the bottom and also in the top temporarily, and this keeps them in place. Also note that there is something that you see that is squeezed out. This is the epoxy that's placed in the, um, between the segments. We saw workers placing this, and this is what is on the inside now of the segment. What this is doing is sealing any water, any oils, or any gasoline, any type of uh, thing that would be spilled on the bridge from coming down inside the bridge. What we have here, the workers are building the forms for the closure pour. This will join the uh, cantilever together. Now, as we look at it, we see that they're placing the duct and all the steel inside. The actual pour will take place Saturday morning at 5 o'clock. As you know, concrete expands and contracts, so we have to have a certain temperature when the a pour is made, either early in the morning or very late in the evening. This particular one is scheduled for very early in the morning. What we have here are the tendons that have been post-tension. This is a group of 15 uh, strand. These will be cut, and then uh, grout is pumped in there, and then this will have a cap over it and totally seal it off from the elements. Here's one that's already been cut, uh, ready for the cap. It, uh, as you note, there is a hole right here. This was be, will be where the uh, grout is pumped in there, then they will uh, cap it, and then it becomes totally waterproof. What we're looking at is the actual hole for the drainage system for the bridge. This is what we call an environmentally friendly bridge, both how it's built, because we have less columns due to the box girder type of construction, but also for the drainage system. All of the rainwater, all of the oils, gasoline, anything that's spilled on the road bed up on the top side goes into scupper holes, flows down into fiberglass pipes, then divides about midway of the bridge and flows into retention ponds where it settles before it goes back into our groundwater. So we're very pleased about this aspect of our bridge. What we have here is the lighting for the interior of the bridge. You see the electrical conduit. We have lighting both in inside and outside on the bridge. We also have lighting for the columns, the up lighting for the columns of the bridge. But this happens to be strictly for the workers, uh, DOT, the maintenance people, as they come in to make an inspection of the bridge. So they will have light and be able to move freely on the inside. Tom, what was the thing you enjoyed most about the inside of the bridge? Chip, I still can't believe I stood on one of the segments that was just put in place 24 hours before. The thing I enjoyed uh, the most was the jack that puts 350 pounds of pressure on the tendons pulling those segments together. Well, stay tuned because coming up next is Betty Hardy taking a look at the full-scale model of the bridge. Tom, this is our scale model, which is built on one inch to 50 feet scale. We are presently located here in the Old Ray's Restaurant at the southwest corner of the present southbound bridge. You'll note that we do have some major changes in this area. The, on the scale model, the northbound bridge has been taken out. These are the fenders, the old fenders from the bridge. But you come underneath the new bridge and in, right into downtown Stewart. Our new bridge, in turn, lines up perfectly with US-1 and then on, uh, carrying you on south on US-1. 
Now, to get back to our, re uh, our area here, you would take a right on Atlanta Avenue and come back into the Ray's Restaurant area. Coming over to the bridge area here, this is where my pointer is. This is the present northbound bridge that we'll be driving on toward the end of the year in late fall of this year. As we come on across and out into the uh, channel area, this is where the bridge actually goes up to 65 feet above high tide. This is exactly lines up with the present channel area for the old bridge and the railroad as you come across. Now, you note something very strange out here. We do have some uh, clear lucite columns out here. This is simply holding up the glass for our model, which we have taken off for the purposes of this demonstration. We are now in the channel area of our bridge in the, on the south looking north as we move along to the north side of the bridge. Just follow my pointer as we move on our northbound bridge. We're coming on across. Note that we have the train which is running directly underneath our bridge. This is one of the reasons, Tom, that our bridge is so high. We must be 28 feet to clear the train. We're actually about 35 feet in this area. Then we're slowly coming down and over to Wright Boulevard and coming back to grade. Now, one of the interesting things uh, that this allows our people from Jensen Rao, if they want to go on the new bridge from, uh, as they come in on 707 Dixie Highway, they will make a right on Wright Boulevard, go down and make a left onto the US-1, which will carry them across on the new bridge. However, if they want to go the old way, they still can. Once the bridge work is completed, they will stay on 707 Dixie Highway, and this will go directly under our new bridge and then in turn take you into downtown Stewart or any of the businesses on the north side. If you live on Fork Road, there has been one major change in this area. No longer will you be allowed to make a left turn off US-1 and cross to come into Fork Road. What will happen is you will go down to Wright Boulevard, make a U-turn and come back and then a right into Fork B Road. We will have a brand new light on, uh, at this intersection which will allow for that U-turn. So if you're coming out of Fork Road, you will make a right and go on to the new bridge. However, suppose you wanted to go to some of the shops there on the north side over there, some of the marinas. You will get in the far right side, far right lane, come down underneath the bridge and either make a right or a left and go underneath the bridge. And that takes you back to 707 Dixie Highway. There are a number of options, Tom, that you will have if you live in this area. Either you will drive on the new bridge uh, which is, will become US-1, or you will have the option of coming into downtown Stewart or to the businesses on State Road 707 Dixie Highway. I hope we've answered some of your questions with our scale model. We are located in the Old Ray's Restaurant, 32 South Federal Highway. This is at the southwest corner of our present southbound bridge. Our office is, is open eight to five, five days a week, closed weekends and holidays. Or if you have any questions, please feel free to call me at 286-6825. Before concluding tonight's documentary, Tom and I wish to thank some of the different people that helped make this program possible. George Denty of the Florida DOT, Christopher White, Charlie Cross, and Betty Hardy. Thank you very much. Your help was invaluable with this program. Chip, they were very helpful from beginning to end. One of the things I found most interesting was that the first bridge was built in 1918. Then we had improvements in the 30s, the 60s, and here we are in the 90s really improving things. One of the things I enjoyed most about the project is that Tom and I were learning something new every single day. When we were filming, doing the interviews, the entire project we were learning something new every single day. Chip, you're going to be able to ride bicycles over the new bridge, walk across the new bridge. It's going to be very well lit at night. It's very exciting. We really appreciate everyone watching our documentary tonight, Roosevelt Bridge, The Old and the New. I'm Tom Leary. And I'm Chip Gibson. Good, Good night, night, everyone. everyone.